This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. What went wrong in Iraq? Former diplomat Peter Galbraith says it was the Bush fantasy that we could establish a national army where there was no nation. What's the meaning of the Declaration of Independence? Professor Danielle Allen explains it is the explicit link between liberty and equality. And Bill Press talks with Hillary Clinton expert Jonathan Allen. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Diplomat Peter Galbraith says there's nothing we can do to put Iraq back together again. And we say hello to Peter Galbraith, former ambassador to Croatia, senior diplomatic fellow at the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation, where his work focuses on Iraq, the greater Middle East, and conflict resolution and post-conflict reconstruction, specifically in the Balkans, Indonesia, Iraq, India, Pakistan, and Southeast Asia. Peter Galbraith, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Well, good to be with you again. Now, you just returned from Iraq. Why did you go? What did you find? Uh, well, I was in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, uh, and I've had an association there that goes back uh, 30 years, uh, and I provide uh, advice on an informal basis to the government there. Uh, the situation uh, is um, in Iraq is uh, as uh, difficult as I suppose it, it ever has been. Um, uh, ISIS, the Islamic State in Iraq and Levant, uh, has taken over the entire Sunni uh, regions of Iraq. The Iraqi army, which the U.S. invested hundreds of billions of dollars in building up, has uh, more or less uh, totally disappeared. Of the uh, 17 uh, uh, army divisions, uh, 15 have uh, been decimated. Uh, and uh, the, the country is, uh, uh, or is, it, it's uh, certainly uh, broken up. Uh, uh, the, your, the Sunni and Shiite parts are at war with each other. Uh, Kurdistan, which has always always aspired to be independent, is now on the threshold of independence. As uh, President Barzani, uh, the president of Kurdistan, told me, he said we have a a 1,050, board, uh, 1050 uh, kilometer border with uh, with ISIS, and we have just a 15 kilometer border with uh, the government in Baghdad. Uh, the Kurds feel that they I Iraq is not capable of defending themselves. They have their own army. They're going to defend themselves, uh, and uh, so it's a it's a, a, a very volatile situation. After the U.S. pulled out of Iraq. What do you see as, as having gone wrong? I mean, what, what happened? Well, it, it's not what happened after the U.S. withdrew from Iraq. It's the fact that the United States went into Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, Iraq was a country that was uh, Iraq and Syria uh, were created by uh, uh, the French and British colonialists uh, in the um, it's part of a secret deal made during World War One and executed uh, uh, thereafter, uh, Iraq was a, an artificial state. Uh, uh, it had a Shiite majority, but the British put the Sunnis in a minority in power. Uh, it included in the north uh, and northeast uh, Kurds who uh, had never wanted to be in Iraq and were in rebellion from the, the, the founding of the country until 1991. Um, when their rebellion actually led to the creation of a Kurdish enclave and protected by an American no-fly zone. Uh, so uh, the, the way in which Iraq was held together from 1922 uh, until 2003 was by Sunni strongmen, beginning with the king and, and ending with Saddam Hussein. Uh, when the U.S. came in, it destroyed uh, the brute force that had held Iraq together, uh, the Shiite majority uh, was able to rule but uh, and win elections, but the Sunni minority was never going to accept that. Uh, and uh, 
you had, uh, although the Bush administration pretended somehow that uh, Maliki was a, a Democrat, in fact, he was an authoritarian uh, who, want, uh, or man with authoritarian uh, tendencies, who wanted to make Iraq not, to, not a place for Iraqis, but a place to be ruled by Shiites. The Sunnis wouldn't accept that. Uh, and so his administration has been eight years of conflict, uh, and uh, that opened the door to ISIS. I mean, what is striking about the situation there is uh, that uh, this very extreme group should win so much support in the Sunni areas. And it's not that the Sunnis are, are supporters of Al-Qaeda. It is that they see uh, ISIS, uh, and it has many allies who are not extreme, so extreme, as superior to the Iraqi government. Um, and again, uh, you know, if we talk about what went wrong, uh, it was the, uh, the the fantasy that we could create an Iraqi national army where there was no nation, and this was really a massive and wasteful expenditure initiated by the previous administration. Mm -hmm. President Obama is obviously in a dilemma, having promised to quit a dumb war, but now having to take larger national security interests into account. If you had the opportunity, what do you tell him to do? Uh, I, I think he's on the right course. Uh, there is no no point in the U.S. Uh, reengaging in Iraq. We, we, we are we're not able to to make somebody else's country, especially when the the various groups in that country don't want the country. The Kurds absolutely do not want Iraq. They want an independent Kurdistan. The Sunnis do not agree for with an Iraq that. Uh, it includes rule by the Shiite majority, and the the Shiite majority is not prepared to have a, a significant role for the Sunnis. Uh, and these groups are not even capable of talking to each other at this point. Uh, ISIS is a, uh, a position. Again, this has this is a movement that is supported by the overwhelming population in the Sunni areas, at least right now. Uh, their position is not only that they want to get the Shiites out of power, it's that they actually want to exterminate them as apostates. And the Shiites, are, uh, the, the, there is no Iraqi army, so the defense of Baghdad is now being led by Shiite militias, some of whom are, again, very extreme. There isn't, there isn't a possibility of dialogue between these groups. So uh, President Obama doesn't have any options uh, of, of trying to create a, an Iraqi army. There, there isn't one to be supported. Uh, there's no point in sending arms. In fact, the arms, the, the American military equipment that we did provide, that's what ISIS has. ISIS is, is the best armed force in Iraq. Thank you to uh, United States of America. They, they seized 1,500 armored Humvees. Uh, they have tanks. Uh, uh, so they, they outclass both the Kur in terms of weaponry, the Kurds and the, the Shiites. They send more arms to the Iraqi army. It's another way to send arms to ISIS. And so President Obama is right not to be uh, falling into that trap. Does it make sense for the U.S. perhaps to, to go in and, 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 and erase that artificial boundary and establish a Sunni state, a Shia state, and a Kurdish state? Or, or do they just... I mean, what can 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 that even happen at this point? Uh, 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 the United States can't be in the business of it, it didn't work in, in in terms of making Iraq, and it isn't going to be in the business of uh, unmaking unmaking Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Iraq is already unmade, so. Uh, you know, this is not um, uh, something the United States uh, needs to do. We aren't going to be erasing these boundaries. It's just not our business to do that. Uh, that we, but when when the parties do, when Kurdistan declares itself independent, as it probably will in the next six months, the United States should recognize its independence. Uh, after all, it is a, a, a democratic. Uh, the one democratic part of Iraq, it's pro-American. Uh, it is uh, tolerant. It has, uh, 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 it's a place where Iraq's Christians have gone. Uh, it's a place that um, receives uh, the uh, other, other minorities in Iraq, in fact, also many Arabs. Uh, it, it is um, 
uh, you know, it's pro-American. It was uh, fought on the side of the United States in the 2003 war, uh, a place where there's been very few terrorist incidents. So that that certainly is, you know, we, we can support our friends, but beyond that, uh, I, I don't, you know, I, we, 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 we flatter ourselves if we think we can solve the problem between the Sunnis and the Shiites. Is the situation in Iraq and Syria uh, at all a proxy for our difficulties with Iran? Well, no, because, in fact, our interests and Iran's interests are very much aligned, both in, 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 in uh, uh, Iraq and in actually in Afghanistan. I mean, it's ironic that the two countries have such an estranged relationship. When, uh, when George Bush invaded Iraq, he uh, got rid of Iran's most bitter enemy, Saddam Hussein. This was the uh, regime uh, against which uh, Iran had fought the eight-year Iran-Iraq war, lost a, a, a million lives trying to remove Saddam from power, failed. Uh, the U.S. came in and in a few weeks uh, did that, and then uh, turned Iraq over to the very Shiite religious parties that had been supported by Iran. In fact, uh, one of them... Uh, the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq was actually founded in Iran in 1982. So the, the people who are the, who the Bush administration insta- installed or made possible to be the leaders of Iraq are in fact Iran's best friends in the world, uh, and they Iran does not want to see ISIS or the Sunnis come back um, to either to take Baghdad or to, to uh, go to the holy places of Karbala and Najaf, um, because uh, uh, that would be a huge defeat for Iran. And, and uh, if ISIS should get to Karbala or Najaf, and, and they, 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 there's a certainly a possibility they could get to Karbala without bypassing by, bypassing Baghdad, go to Karbala through the desert. Uh, they, they they could be in a position to destroy one of the holiest places in all of Shia Islam. Mm-hmm. How do we look at, at, with this, as far as what we need to be caring about, our priorities, I mean, we have oil interests, the security of Israel, the growth of Islamic extremism. Um, we can't just turn and walk away. So, so how much do we have to care about all of these things and, and kind of in prior, how would you prioritize those things? Well, we, 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 of course we have interests, but uh, you, you, you say we can't, we can't walk away, but the reality is that there isn't anything that we can do. Um, uh, we, 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 we aren't, can't and shouldn't send in another hundred thousand troops. If we did, it would just be a, a stopgap measure. Yes, we could push ISIS out with American troops, uh, but then when they withdrew, ISIS or some version of it would come back. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I, I think the most we can do is to recognize and support Kurdistan. Uh, that has uh, some very significant oil resources. The moment we're uh, trying to block Kurdistan from selling its oil, uh, you know, at the same time as we want cooperation from the Kurds, uh, we're, we're, we're hurting them. And, of course, that's not the way to get cooperation. Uh, and I think it's likely that the Shiite re- uh, regime in Baghdad will hold on to Baghdad in the south. That's where the oil is in, in that part of Iraq. So that's likely to be um, secure. R- Iraq will still want to be selling the oil. Um uh, I, I don't think that uh, th- these developments pose a, a direct threat to Israel, uh, except that the Sunni areas of Iraq, uh, that is to say, uh, uh, western Iraq and eastern Syria, um, are at the moment under control of, uh, of, uh, of, of some of the most extreme groups in the world, and therefore a breeding ground for terrorism that may end up threatening everybody. However, um, Unless they moderate their behavior, it's likely that uh, um, that the populations there will end up turning against uh, ISIS, uh, especially if some kind of ceasefire is reached with the government in Baghdad. 
Before we let you go, how seriously or how concerned should we be in the West um, about the funda- fundamentalist Muslim drive toward a global caliphate? Uh, you know, we, we should be concerned, but let's not exaggerate the threat. This isn't uh, 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 something like uh, Nazi Germany with all the power that that had or the Soviet Union. Uh, these are uh, extremists uh, uh, who control some pretty remote and uh, barren territory. Uh, yes, it can be used for terrorism. Um, uh, although at the moment they're focused on fighting their regional enemies, that is to say the Shiite government in Baghdad and the Alawite regime in Damascus. Um, so a, a source of concern, but not a not a life and death situation for the United States or the West. Okay. Peter Galbraith, Senior Diplomatic Fellow at the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. So former ambassador to Croatia. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for your time with us today. We look forward to speaking with you again soon. Well, very good talking with you. Thank you. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Princeton professor and MacArthur genius Danielle Allen offers an in-depth look for July 4th at our founding document, the Declaration of Independence. And we'll talk to her about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. What a hoot to see House Speaker John Boehner up on his hind legs, braying like a goofy mule and declaring that, by gollies, he's filing suit against President Obama for, quote, aggressive unilateralism. Or was it unilateral aggressivism? Whatever. Speaker Boehner says it's an outrage. An outrage, I tell you, that a president would issue executive orders to take assorted actions without the approval of Congress, specifically things that Boehner does not approve of. Everywhere I go, spaketh the Speaker. I'm asked, when will the House stand up on behalf of the people to stop the encroachment of executive power under President Obama? Really? Everywhere? That's the question he gets? Maybe he needs to get around to more places. I think he'd find that most people are more concerned about the falling middle class, rising poverty, inequality, climate change, senseless wars, and even the failure of his own leadership to address these real-life issues. Nonetheless, Boehner is suing Obama for his, quote, effort to erode the power of the legislative branch. But wait, let's check the numbers. So far, Obama's White House has issued 168 presidential orders. Yet George W. Bush was far more outrageous, using this power 291 times. Did Boehner try to sue George W. for aggressive unilateralism? No, no. He endorsed many of the Republicans' executive excesses, even writing to Bush in 2008, pleading with him to exercise that presidential power for a national emergency, namely exempting a steamboat in his state from safety regulations. This is Jim Hightower saying, what about Reagan's 381 executive orders, Nixon's 346, Eisenhower's 484, and on and on? I happen to oppose the use of these orders, but I also oppose using them to play crass partisan politics, as this silly speaker is doing. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Professor Danielle Allen has written a book about our most sacred political document, the Declaration of Independence, which intertwines both liberty and equality. 
And we say hello to Dr. Alda, Professor uh, of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. Also a MacArthur Foundation genius and author of a new book about the Declaration of Independence called Our Declaration, a reading of the Declaration of Independence in defense of equality. Dr. Danielle Allen, thank you so much for joining us today on americasdemocrats.org. Great to be here, Jim. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're quite welcome. Nice to have you with us, of course. Um, The central theme of your book is that you can't have liberty without equality. That's right. What does the word equal mean in a legal context, and has that meaning changed in 238 years? So that's a terrific question. Um, So it's important. The Declaration is not a legal document, right? The Declaration sets out a set of aspirations, and its key focus is a concept of political equality, and that concept has five components in the Declaration. So it's a little sort of complicated, but just to lay them out real fast, five different facets. I'd say there's a non-domination facet of equality, meaning nobody should be dominated by another person just in the same way that no nation wants to be dominated by another nation. Then there's an equality of opportunity facet, and that one in the Declaration is really about equality of access to the tool of government that we all need in order to help secure our safety and happiness. And then third, in the Declaration, you've got an equality that is about, um, I mean, there's no way to put it other than to, to call it in very scholarly terms, epistemic egalitarianism, which means that's about how we use knowledge as a community. Can we do that in an egalitarian way? And that's basically an idea about needing broad education and then drawing on a broadly educated community to make sure that collectively we're pooling the knowledge that we need to make good decisions together. Then there's a facet of equality that's about reciprocity. This is about how citizens treat each other. Can we interact with each other in decent ways in our civil society? And that you can think of as connecting to issues of freedom of speech and rights of association, but also of decency and um, avoiding hate crimes and that sort of thing. And then there's a fifth facet, which I think of as being the co-creatorship of our public world or co-ownership. It's when at the end of the declaration, they mutually commit to each other, their lives, their lives, liberties and their their sacred honor, their fortunes and their sacred honor. And that facet of equality is is really about participatory politics, the notion that we all should be able to take a part so that we can make our world together, the world of which we are co-owners. So you asked a question about equality in the law. How does each of those elements of equality factor in? Well, in the law, we have equal rights with regard to voting. That's a critical piece of it. But also at state government level, many state constitutions write in um, a right to basic education, sound basic education. That's a really important way in which equality factors into the law. So there are lots of different parts of our law that pick up different features of the ideal of equality expressed in the Declaration, and it has certainly changed over the two centuries. Mm -hmm. Was the Declaration of Independence considered as significant a document at the time of its circulation as it was later in history? Well, there are two sides of an answer to that question, in all honesty. So you'll get, you'll see stories that Jefferson and Adams didn't realize how important it was until much later. I mean, sort of at the end of their lives, they really wanted to take credit for it and so forth. But, you know, about 10 years after the Declaration was promulgated, some members of the committee didn't even remember having served on the committee, which is a, an amazing thing to think. At the same time, though, that it in some sense seemed to fade away, when it was first promulgated, Everybody went crazy, so there were bonfires all over Philadelphia and bells ringing all night long, and the text just spread as fast as possible throughout the colonies and all the newspapers, and Washington read it to his soldiers, and there were celebrations everywhere. So on the day itself when it was announced, absolutely, it was taken as tremendously important. It was a huge celebration. Adams wrote home to his wife that nothing more important had happened and so forth. But then, you know, 10 years later, some folks who had been involved didn't even remember having been involved. So there was that sort of strange shift. And then another another sort of 20, 30 years later, it absolutely came back to the forefront. They didn't have Facebook, <laughs> you, know, I mean, didn't, you know, I mean, the social media yeah, and, all- and that sort of thing. Although you'd be surprised. I mean, although things moved a lot slower, they definitely moved. I mean, they were a seriously networked group of people, and they are, there were so many print shops all through the colonies you know, churning things out. It's incredible, really, how much effort went into spreading the news. Yeah. Well, again, we're speaking with uh, Professor Danielle Allen, professor of social science at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, and we're talking about her, her new book, Our Declaration, a reading of the Declaration of Independence in Defense of Equality. 
The Declaration of Independence is generally considered a great example of Enlightenment thinking, yet the principal authors, who were not particularly religious, gave much credit to the Creator and uh, to divine providence. Was this a political or ideological compromise? The text is a master of compromise, and it compromises on two fronts. One is the religion front, the other is the slavery front. So it's important to remember how many different voices fed into the creation of the Declaration. So the committee that drafted it had five people on it. Adams and Franklin were two of the members, and they were critical. To, you know, even basic word choices, like self-evident, was something that was not in Jefferson's original draft. And some of the language about the creator was not in Jefferson's original draft. Adams was very devout. So you have you know, polyphonic, multivocal experience there. They then take it to the Continental Congress, which has a whole lot of different opinions, and more revisions get made. And then the final document actually even then gets modified again by the printers and the calligraphers who add capitalization and punctuation and things like that, putting emphases in new places. So absolutely there's compromise. There are multiple voices in this document. With regard to religion specifically, I think the thing that's quite amazing about the document is that it walks this amazingly fine line so that although there is the language about the creator and divinity and so forth, there is no language in it that connects the text to any specific religion. And the language of um, the creator and, and so forth is used in a way that also suited deists, that is to say people who really thought that what mattered was the concept of nature more than anything else. In your opinion, is liberty, and the United States of America itself, something given by God or more by force of arms? Well, I mean, I think I wouldn't really, I suppose, set the question up that way. So I take it that every living creature um, desires fundamentally liberty. So that is in our Constitution as we emerge from nature. And then you can decide whether you want to think of nature as a product simply of nature or as a product of God. I think in some sense it doesn't matter there. So we have we are liberty-desiring creatures. And so then the question is, how do we realize that? I would say we're not only liberty-desiring creatures, we're also equality-desiring creatures, because at the end of the day, liberty comes from equality. In my relationship with you, if I am not equal to you, I have no liberty. So equality comes before liberty. We, we need that in our relations with each other in order to have liberty in the first place. So then as the hard question is, how do you actually secure those things over the long term? And that's where the work of politics comes in. And so, yes, I mean, the work of politics is in the best, it's the work of words, work of talk and argument and deliberation and institutional process that provides us with institutional ways of managing conflict. And in the worst case scenario, when that, when that, that breaks down, which you have to seek your utmost to avoid, then sometimes their issue of war comes in. But so I wouldn't call liberty sort of the product of one thing or the other. The job of politics is to secure equality and liberty together, equality as the foundation for liberty. And in the ideal, we do that work through words and institutions. Okay. Now, Virginians played a key role in drafting the Declaration of Independence and the Virginia Declaration of Rights, but they came from a state that was so central to the preservation of slavery. How does one rationalize that? Well, they did play a key role, as they did in all the politics of that day, but they are not the only ones who played key roles. And so, again, it's so important to remember that the Committee of Five that drafted the Declaration included John Adams from Massachusetts, who was against slavery, never owned slaves, and Benjamin Franklin, who was also against slavery and contributed to the first abolitionist movements in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, which were already in gear just in the years immediately after the Declaration, trying to get rid of slavery. And even in one early case, the, the Quakers put forward a petition trying to get Congress to get rid of slavery through the whole new country, and they got Franklin to help them submit that. So the folks who drafted the Declaration really had positions on both sides of the matter. And that comes through in the text itself. The Virginia Declaration of Rights, in the place where it does the equivalent to talking about the self-evident truths, invokes a right to property. The Virginians use that property concept to try to protect slavery. The Declaration does not invoke that concept. Instead, it puts all its reliance on the concept of happiness. This, I think, was really Adams' key contribution. He wrote a pamphlet called Thoughts on Government that was published in April of 1776, and in it he argues that the number one purpose of government is to secure happiness, to secure the opportunity for people to pursue happiness. And so it's his voice that we hear in that opening section, and it's his voice moderating what the Virginians had to offer.
Okay. Now, in the context of today's politics, where does the Tea Party go wrong in trying to compare its extreme vision of America to the Declaration of Independence? Well, it's interesting. I mean, they've got so many different versions of Tea Party declarations of independence out there that there's no single central text, or at least not as best of, as I've been able to tell. But one of the things that's really striking to me about the documents that are out there that I have read is that they frequently seem to be, they declare de- independence from progressives, that is to say, from their fellow citizens who hold different views from themselves. And that's really the opposite of what the Declaration did. In the Declaration, you see a group of people who had radically opposed points of view, again, particularly on matters of both religion and slavery. And yet, they realized that the most important thing was to build this set of institutions that let people, even with great divergences of view, make decisions together. So the idea of declaring independence from your fellow citizens, to me, just seems quite the opposite of what the Declaration about. Okay, I'm here, here. <laughs> Danielle Allen, professor of social science at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. She is the author of Our Declaration, a reading of the Declaration of Independence in Defense of Equality, and joining us here today on America's Democrats.org. Dr. Allen, thank you so much for your time with us today. We look forward to doing it again with you soon. Thanks for having me, Jim. It was a great conversation. I appreciate it. And we thank you for your time. And this is America's Democrats.org, the weekly netcast for Stand Up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now, Bill Press and his guest, Bloomberg News Washington Bureau Chief Jonathan Allen. John Boehner says, we won't do anything, and if President Obama tries to do something, we'll sue him. Yeah, that's what they're going to do. Good morning, everybody. It's Thursday, June 26th. Welcome, welcome to the show. The Bill Press Show coming to you live nationwide, coast to coast, on your local progressive talk radio station. And booming out to you worldwide on our video stream at Talker TV, youtube.com slash Talker, T A W K R TV. Good to have you with us this Thursday morning. We're coming to you from our nation's capital and our studio on Capitol Hill uh, with our entire team. Well, not the entire team. At least Murphy's got the day off uh, up in um, Rhode Island, Block Island, Rhode Island. Huh? For a little Beautiful. Wedding. Beautiful, Beautiful place, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, John Allen joins us from Bloomberg News, covers the White House for Bloomberg News, and co-author with Amy Parnes of uh, the great book, HRC. This is even better than Hillary's book. Well, John. thank you, Bill. I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> no, no. Uh, it is. This is the real stuff here, right? And uh, it's much lighter. Yeah, oh, that's it's quite true, as, too. <laughs> it's, it's, it's more portable. <laughs> uh, Peter Ogburn here leading the team. Hey, hey, hey. Peter, uh, with Alicia Cruz. Hi, Alicia. She's got the phones covered. 866-55-PRESS is your toll-free number. And um, uh, Cyprian Bowling's got uh, the time off, too, a couple, couple of, a week or so off. And so Monty Kanzler is here on our uh, video cam, keeping us looking good on the worldwide video stream, Talker TV. So uh, it's here, John. My first question to you is I know this is kind of a personal question, but um, from what I can see, I—, I I might be able to guess the answer, but I have to ask you. So, do you have any tattoos? I don't have any tattoos. No. I have no tattoos. My grandfather always said, don't get a tattoo where a judge can see it. So, you're good on that front. <laughs> <Is> that right? <laughs> well, Pat, all i got to say is Pat Robertson will be glad to hear that. Yesterday on his 700 Club, he got a, 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 a question from a viewer about whether or not it was okay to get a tattoo as long as it was a tattoo of Jesus. Here's Pat Robertson. Is getting a tattoo of Jesus a sin? I see many people with religious tattoos. Does that make it okay? Well, it doesn't make it okay because it's religious, believe me. I mean, it could be just the same the tattoo of some hoochie-coosh girl. I mean, it doesn't really make any difference. The tattoos. Uh, you look at the Bible, and the, the, the people were told not to mark their bodies and cut themselves like the heathen did. Mm-hmm. Tattooing is a heathen practice. It is not a Christian practice. A heathen practice, John. <laughs> well, look, I, look, <laughs> you know, you're, uh, 
you are not supposed to be buried in a Jewish cemetery if you uh, have a, a tattoo or other body modifications. So uh, is that right? Yeah, I mean, this is so. I didn't know. Uh, that. Well, it's Pat heathen Robertson's behavior. Language, Pat Robertson's onto something. Well, his language of of heathenism and, and sin is probably not one that the uh, that that most people uh, share. I think that uh, it's not. He's certainly not the only one. And. Uh, like I said, in the Jewish religion, you're not supposed to be buried in a is, cemetery. Is it, but is it practiced that way? Is it? I, I think it is a deterrent against uh, most Jews getting tattoos. Is it still? Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's just one of the. I mean, well, I think it's looked at more traditionally. Yeah. Rather than as a, a religious dictate, I think people don't do it because it's the tradition, not because it's. Well, here's here's in the Bible. Pa- th- then p- picking up on that. Here's how far back it goes. Again, Pat Robertson. It is a heathen practice, and it is prohibited in the Old Testament. And so the fact that it's Jesus doesn't make a bit of difference, all right? There you go. Not to mention the iconography. uh, You know, I mean, I I don't know if you start to get into... Uh, if an image of Jesus is, becomes a false idol, if it's not, you know, <laughs> oh, if man. it's not the right oh, image whoa, of Jesus. Yeah. Oh, we're getting to, but now, I have to say, one of our I'm guests. I'm not a religious scholar, by the way. I should no. just. <laughs> one, uh, one of our guests and one of our favorite guests, uh, I'm not going to mention her name, her name, has, she told me, nine tattoos. You can only see one of them. Uh, when, when was she, she the one in. that was just in studio? No. <laughs> I'm not, no. No, but I'm not going to mention, I'm going to go beyond that. So. I don't know what that says about her. I, I am Pat unt- Robertson would say, you're going to burn in hell. Even. 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 Yeah. Well, look, I'm, I don't have a tattoo. And one reason is that if you expect large weight gain or loss, that the tattoos can look a lot different. So That's you, right. If yeah. you have the words say something different when they expand. <laughs> the I don't have any because I don't like pain. You know, I mean, they hurt. I've been told. I've been told. <laughs> I, that, you know, I don't want somebody. Just, you know, That's also a good deterrent. <laughs> don't you think? How many do you have, Peter? No comment. I refer, I, re- I refer to the earlier comment I made about never get a tattoo where a judge can see it. All right. Uh, we'll, take, <laughs> we'll take it at that. Yes, indeed. Uh, so uh, we'll get into um, the how, how's Hillary doing with her new book, Hard Choices. So, John Allen, uh, you are the uh, world's author- one of the world's authorities now on Hillary Clinton, having written the book uh, HRC with Amy. Um, How's her book tour doing, Hard Choices? Uh, well, I, I, up and down, huh? Up and down. I think, you know, look, anybody that sells as many books as she has sold uh, should be happy. Uh, both of us having been authors, it's not easy to uh, to sell books in the, in the six-figure level, um, and she's done that. But uh, we get new reports uh, out yesterday. The book scan numbers are out. Her uh, sales dropped way off, as did most other books uh, right after Father's Day. Um, mm-hmm. She dropped from... <laughs> Somewhere in the eighty-five thousand range on BookScan, which doesn't capture all the books, uh, to forty-five, forty-eight thousand, something like that. It was about a forty-four. So sales drop are off. down. Sales are down. That's to be expected. Um, that's absolutely typical. You have a you peak with the release and all those media interviews, yeah. and then uh, usually drop off a little bit. But this was a pretty severe drop off. But there's been more attention to the fact that in in almost every public appearance talking about the book. She has made one gap, at least one gap, starting with the most notorious, I guess, Diane Sawyer, about we were so broke when we left the White House, we could not uh, figure out how we were going to pay mortgages on our multiple houses. I'm paraphrasing, but... And and Bill Clinton came out and defended her and said, it is factually accurate that we were in debt when we came out of the White House. Of course, most people coming out of the White House don't have... uh, you know, tens of millions of dollars in book deals headed their way. They don't have the ability to borrow a million dollars or more from Terry McAuliffe to finance their mortgage. Uh, and they, they don't, they just, I mean, and they, the idea they that they were struggling. They don't get $200,000 for a half-hour speech. Right, and the idea that they were struggling, and she talked about them struggling when they came out of the White House is absurd. Uh, she's not only made mistakes seemingly at every leg, but often the same mistake, hmm. which is to not appreciate uh, how wealthy she is, um, and to not accept it. Uh, I don't think people, I don't think voters hold it against candidates that they're rich. They just well, hold it against candidates who don't understand that they're rich or don't understand what the, the average person's going through. So no, this that's is what I've been thinking. I mean, why, do, uh, why pretend that they're not? I mean, they're wealthy and, and again, good for them, you know, and they, they went through some lean years and now they're, they're enjoying, uh, some good sources of income. I mean, the Kennedys, people didn't, 
take hold it against the Kennedys because they were they were wealthy. This yeah. famous moment with Ted Kennedy in his first Senate race, and the opponent attacked him for not having worked a day in his life, and he basically looked out at some factory workers and said. Uh, which of you would prefer to, to work if you didn't have to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. You know, and handled it well. well. He lived well in that skin. Yeah. So what what does this say, or, or if anything, about Hillary Clinton slash candidate? I mean, does it say that she is just out of practice, maybe, or just having a rough period, or does it say anything at all? Oh, I think it says that her view of her life is very different than that from the outside. Then, you know, I mean, I think uh, from, you know, from her point of view, she did struggle. From her point of view, uh, there were many years that were lean. And I think that's true. You know, when they were in Arkansas, it wasn't they were certainly weren't oh, yeah. uh, right. as wealthy yeah. as they are now. Um, mm-hmm. But I but I do think that there's a major disconnect between her view of her own life story and that uh, of the outside world. And. Um, you know, she's got to find a way to, to close that gap. And even if she's unable to fully absorb that difference and, and understand it, she needs to at least intellectualize it so she can talk about it better. Uh, she will continue to be asked about this, I guarantee, uh, not only today and tomorrow, but uh, if she's on the campaign trail, it's something she will uh, th- will now dog her. How do you think that the uh, the difficulties that that the Obama Obama administration is experiencing today in Iraq, in Iran, in Syria, uh, reflect on Hillary Clinton's plans for 2016? Uh, I don't think they'll affect her plans. I think her plan is to say, hey, I've been here, I've done this, Uh, I'm better at foreign policy than Barack Obama. That's the the not so subtle message in her book where she talks about the places where she had differences with him uh, on Syria in particular. Um, so I think I, I think you're basically, as you project forward, I don't think she's going to back off of running because mm-hmm. of some of the difficulties here. I think it changes her message. I think she's had some I think she's had some difficulty, uh, and this is this gets the the question of writing a book and the wisdom of doing that, writing a backward looking book. Uh, as you're attempting to run for president, uh, there is a an economic driver here. She's got a book contract. She has to write about the past, uh, what she did as secretary of state. But it's a terrible way to launch a presidential campaign because now she's yeah. she's going to be asked about things that are almost exclusively in the present in terms of uh, foreign policy or in the past, not the future. Um, and if, if it gets, sticks her in places where, you know, like the world's changing uh, as uh, as as we speak, it's changing. Yeah. And, and so your view of things is not static, but the book is static. And she's going to be pinned down on everything that's in that book and end up talking a lot about it instead of the future. Most candidates put out some sort of bromide-laden right. you know, platform before they run. Yeah, uh, that's right. It's a burden, uh, a benefit and a burden, I guess. And some of the Democrats that I've talked to have are expressed a little concern that her difficulties on the book tour in her interviews – Remind them that as a candidate in 2008, she had her flaws as a candidate, too, right? And yeah. so still maybe a she, she hates the press and not uh, not just you, Bill, press, but the, <laughs> the larger uh, media. She's she's really not a fan and uh, becomes extremely defensive in interviews. Um, and it is, it's apparent, and you can see it in her face and you can hear it in her voice, that she doesn't want to be where she is when she's being interviewed. And uh, it comes off terribly. John Allen here. He is uh, with Bloomberg News, covers the White House for Bloomberg News, also co-author with Amy Parnes of HRC. Uh, The big issue, of course, lately has been the president dealing with Iraq. What are his options? What's he going to do? I mean, he's going to. He He says that there are no options (laughs) that are uh, off the table. Um, But what does that mean? I think they're going to try to do uh, whatever they can to uh, to stand up an Iraqi government against, you know, to make sure that Baghdad doesn't fall, those kinds of things. And when I say whatever they can, that doesn't include the uh, massive use of American force. Uh, The president's stuck. I mean, there's this great irony now that President Obama is sending in military. They call them advisors uh, under essentially under the Iraq war authorization from 2002 that he he he, opposed. That he opposed. Um, Right. And I think I don't think there's hypocrisy in there in that. I think there's uh, um, reality in that. And I think, you know, if it were up to him, we would have been out of Iraq the day that he uh, set foot in the White House. But he's being forced. I mean, you know, there are there are now American uh, not just American assets, but interests there. You've got the entire uh, the entire green zone. There are a lot of Americans there. Um, 
So I don't think he has a lot of choice but to protect what's there that are that is ours and and uh, try to stand up uh, or help support a government. And I, when I say that, I don't mean the leader of that government necessarily. I just mean the stability of the government. It's the same problem I think they had in Syria where they would have liked to have had uh, Assad's group in power in Syria, just not Assad. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and that that is a problem in Iraq is uh, Nori Amaliki, who – uh, doesn't seem willing to or able to do what ha- has to be done. And, and what President Obama says is the answer here, which is a unified government. Yeah, and it's, um, you know, I think there were people who warned about this all along, that you were never going to see uh, a unified Iraq, that it would be uh, one one section or one sector uh, mm-hmm. winning over the other. Yeah, uh, and uh, the chief, uh, chief among those voices was... Vice President Joe Biden, when he was in the Senate, I re- I remember well. Out of time, John. Nice to see you today. My pleasure. Thanks good for your you. good work. Uh, continue to follow um, former Secretary of State on the trail. I'm sure you will. Don't forget, if you don't have it yet, get the book, HRC. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks a lot, Bill. That's all for AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Peter Galbraith. Danielle Allen, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For americasdemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate.